a little bit on uh, Joseph Morris. He is, uh, as Saul Alinsky was, a Chicago operative. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's the first thing you learn there, probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Joe is a graduate of the college and the law school of the University of Chicago, Southside. Is a partner in the law firm of Morris and De La Rosa, with offices in Chicago and London, maintaining an active practice in constitutional, business, labor, and international law. Uh, member of the bars of the Supreme Court of the United States, Supreme Court of Illinois, several other courts. Mr. Morris served under President Ronald Reagan as Assistant Attorney General of the United States in charge of international affairs and Director of the Department of Justice of Justice Office of Liaison Services. Uh, we should also welcome uh, Kathy Morris who is here today, uh, Joe's wife, and thanks for being with us here today. So uh, I'd like Joe to come up now and get us started. Uh, we are going to um, have a time reserved at the end of this speech for your questions, and we'll pass the microphone around, so I'm sure there will be a lot of those. And uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Joseph Morris. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back um, at the Acton Institute. Over the years, I've had a, a lot of interaction with this organization, both here in Grand Rapids and in Chicago and elsewhere around the country. It's a, a wonderful institution, and I'm really quite flattered that so many of you have turned out today to hear what I have to say. The subject of my remarks today is the late Saul Alinsky. Um, I had the remarkable uh, privilege, uh, I suppose, of actually meeting him and knowing him and seeing his work in action. Uh, I, I was, he was born in... 1909. I was born in 1951. Uh, when I was 17 or 18 years old in the late 1960s, um, just a few years before his death in 1973, um, uh, Saul Alinsky, uh, armed as he usually was with funds from faith-based organizations, well, specifically from churches, in this particular instance the Roman Catholic Church in the Chicago area, attempted a revival of community-based, community-level organizing on the ground in the area of South, South Chicago, the south side of Cook County, and uh, the northwest corner of the state of Indiana. Uh, the stretch basically from uh, Portage, Indiana, around through Gary, Hammond, East Chicago, Whiting, and up into South Chicago. The Steel Belt, the south end of Lake Michigan where there are lots of steel mills. The area known uh, because of the little river system there, the Calumet uh, River, which, which doesn't have any rapids at all, uh, flows from um, a uh, very short distance uh, inside Indiana uh, and then into Illinois and empties into, the, into Lake Michigan, the Calumet River system. This was called the Calumet Community Congress. Um, it quickly imploded uh, within just a year or two after consuming tens of thousands of dollars of parish money and hundreds of thousands of dollars of diocesan money uh, in Chicago and, uh, and in northwest Indiana. Um, it, it collapsed of its own weight because of a uh, what I will describe uh, to you eventually as the, the cornerstone of the Alinsky model of social action, which is generating conflict. And uh, every once in a while, there, there, there was what by Saul Alinsky's lights was a huge success. A conflict would be generated between community groups, community constituencies, ethnic groups, and so on, and somebody in power, a government or a, an employer, a factory or something like that, which is what he, what he intended. But um, as one dissects the actual operations of so many uh, Alinsky operations on the ground, uh, more often than not, what his community organizers succeeded in doing, uh, putatively unintentionally, was generating conflict between the very groups they were trying to organize. Uh, and then that would result in the implosion, the collapse of, uh, of many of the organizing uh, efforts. Uh, and that's precisely what happened with the Calumet Community Congress in the late 1990s and very early 1970s, uh, 1960s and early 1970s. In, in the Northwest Indiana component. The South Side Chicago component, however, survived into the 1980s, long enough so that by the 1980s there were still 10 Roman Catholic parishes on the South Side of Chicago that were providing funds and other resources for this remnant of the Alinsky Calumet Community Congress. And uh, for a couple of years, they employed um, a young uh, community organizer 
uh, of whose name you may have heard. It was Mr. Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, Mr. Obama himself uh, describes um, his activity uh, as a community organizer in the Alinsky Network. Uh, in his autobiography, um, <coughs> Dreams from My Father, uh, and uh, describes with considerable candor the um, frustrations that he, he found with the, the work. At the same time, he, however, he describes with considerable candor the, the methods that he used, and they were classic uh, Alinsky methods. Um, there were, uh, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, there were some modest successes in his, in his activity, but um, he encountered a, what, what seemed to him to be at the time a surprising frustration. And that was he, was, he was trying to organize African Americans on the south side of Chicago to rise up in some kind of constructive rebellion against the city government of Chicago, trying to identify some issue. And this, this is the classic Alinsky model, going into a community and, and, and you know, listening, finding out what is it that people are mad about, then agitating them to get even madder about whatever it is they are about and to find a target. Uh, no surprise, people were unhappy that there were inadequate public services, municipal services, uh, uh, in, in their part of town, uh, and they would gladly tell you what needs they thought they had, whether it related to housing or related to job opportunities or, you know, em employment centers, job reference bureaus, that sort of thing. But when, following the Alinsky model, Mr. Obama attempted to focus their anger and their irritation on the public officials who had power to do something about it, it failed utterly. And it took him a moment, or it took him a little bit of time, as he describes in Dreams from My Father, to figure out why. But the answer was, who was the mayor of Chicago in the early 1980s and mid-1980s? It was a fellow by the name of Harold Washington, who, who was the idolized political leader of the very community that Mr. Obama was being paid to agitate. Um, this was someone whose election uh, to the Chicago mayoralty uh, was viewed as a huge social, cultural, political breakthrough for African Americans in Chicago. This was the last person that African Americans in Chicago wanted to demonstrate against or you know, demonize. Um, and in as much as the Alinsky model offered you know, next to no alternative how to, how to go about organizing, even that effort collapsed and it did not survive much after <coughs> Mr. Obama himself uh, abandoned it. Um, you can look around the country at the um, efforts that Saul Alinsky and his, his organizations made to achieve some kind of improvement by their lights in human conditions. Began in Chicago in the, in the 1930s. Saul Alinsky was a labor union organizer. Um, and um, he, uh, a, a union organizer, has a very specific job that's very, I think, very easy to understand. A union organizer's job is to sign up members of a union. And depending on what the circumstances are, that can be very easy um, if empl employment situations are not good, if, em employ if, if, if a particular employer um, is not kind, is not competent, is, is, is not someone with whom it's easy to get along, uh, if working conditions uh, in fact are poor, uh, and people who are working for a, an employer often see you know, on, the, on the ground, on the shop floor, and, and, and easy ways in which the company could be made better. I mean, you, all, you, know, you face the reality, not, not, not all firms are operated as competently and as successfully as some of, your, some of the big institutions, successful companies here in Grand Rapids of which this community is justifiably proud. Uh, you know, some are rather badly managed, and sometimes people who are in the, in the rank and file of the, sh of the shop floor can easily see ways in which it would be possible to improve the operation of the com company, even improve the bottom line for the owners and the shareholders and, and, and so forth, while at the same time improving working conditions for people doing the job producing the product or the service or whatever it may be. Under those circumstances, it, it, when, when it seems logical for workers to engage in collective action, it becomes very easy to organize them into a union. Uh, the, sometimes the, the, the sale sort of sells itself in American history over the last hundred years. However, there are many circumstances in which that's not at all the case. And unions, you know, themselves are businesses like any other. They've got payroll, they've got overhead, they've got employees of their own, some of whom are unionized against them, some of them are better 
some are worse managers than others. There are the, all these ironic cases where you, you, you find, I mean, even currently, where there are unions that go on strike against the unions that employ them um, uh, because of unhappy working conditions and, and, and so forth. But it's, it, it's, it's necessary, it's necessary uh, it has been necessary, or viewed as necessary by unions over the years to send out people into the field to organize, to persuade workers to sign up for the union. And that's not always an easy sell when the company is well managed, when working conditions are good, when salary and fringe benefits are, are good, and it's obviously that the company is successful and, and so forth. But it, it, it can be a tough, so why do we want to unionize and, and risk uh, all of the things that we see that are working so well, inhibit the flexibility of management when management is obviously competent, and so on and so forth. And so union organizers have developed techniques to sell union membership under circumstances that are not obviously, uh, you know, don't sell themselves. That's what Saul Alinsky did uh, in his early working days. Um, he, he, he organized people to join unions, persuaded people to join unions, and that often involved you know, educating them, sort of raising consciousness in the jargon of the 60s, about why you should be angry with your employer and, and why you should feel frustrated with your employer and why you should be demanding change. And the way to demand change is to band together, create an organization, the union, and then you know, with the, the strength that comes with solidarity, you can present your grievances to, to management and often ameliorate things. That, that's the model. Uh, Linskyism is rooted in the, in the labor relations uh, model, but has nothing to do with it. Uh, for, for Alinsky, left uh, the industrial arena. He left the, the business of, uh, of labor organizing and instead took the concept of organizing from labor to the community and sought to apply this, the same notion. You, you, whether you know it or not, you have and should have grievances against people who are in power. And so do your neighbors, and uh, so do other people in your situation. And so what we want to do is show you that you've got those grievances, uh, and then persuade you that if you band together, create strength, you can take those grievances you know, with this new power, and you can confront uh, the oppressor, whoever the oppressor is, and, and effect uh, change. This is what Alinsky sought to do, and he did it over a period of decades. Uh, Alinsky was Jewish, as am I, a, a product of Chicago, and the University of Chicago, lived in the University of Chicago uh, neighborhood. Curiously, though, throughout most of his career, most of his funding came from, from Catholic and Protestant uh, churches and, and church groups, especially in Chicago, uh, especially from the Archdiocese of Chicago. He made some important sallies out of Chicago to the West Coast, to California, and, and the, the first major time he did that, that was funded by a consortium of Protestant churches on the West Coast led by a Presbyterian church. Um, and um, the first great episode of community organizing by Alinsky was in the so-called back of the yards neighborhood in Chicago. The yards in question were the old Chicago stockyards. The Union stockyards that were located on the south side of Chicago, if any of you have ever been to the, wherever to the old International Amphitheater on Halstead Street in the, um, the 4,000 blocks, uh, you were there. You were at the heart of the, um, of the stockyards, and people who lived behind, behind the yards, that is west of the stockyards, away from the lake, in the, in the bungalow belts and residential neighborhoods uh, behind the stockyards, um, were the first targets uh, of Alinsky's organizing. They were not African American, they were white, often Eastern European ethnics, uh, ethnic uh, populations, uh, many of them Roman Catholic, and um, their supposed grievances ranged from working conditions in the yards to environmental conditions. I mean, not, not to make too fine a point about it, but if you lived anywhere near the yards and the winds blew the wrong way, and they usually did, um, uh, things smelled and, um, and you know, so on and, and so forth down, down the line. Now, um, Alinsky later uh, sought to organize African-American populations in Chicago and, and in the end uh, made most of his, um, most of his activity was, was oriented toward organizing African-Americans. The one organization of any prominence that he created uh, was the Woodlawn Organization, named after the Woodlawn neighborhood, which is immediately south of the Hyde Park neighborhood which in Chicago, which is where the University of Chicago is. And the, the, the main villain, uh, the main foe uh, around whom uh, Alinsky agitated to organize the Woodlawn Organization, surprisingly or not, uh, was the, the great landowner and employer in the area, the University of Chicago. Uh, he cast the University of Chicago in the role of the villain uh, who, uh, and, 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 he, and he cast the University of Chicago uh, in, in what would become the paradigm of, of villainy. It was racist, racist uh, uh, villainy. Uh, what the University of Chicago was doing in the, um, in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, the post-war the post 
first two decades or so after World War II, was wrestling with the fundamental question of whether or not to stay in Chicago. Uh, the south side neighborhood of Chicago, out, or, 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 other than the Hyde Park neighborhood itself, was, was rapidly changing demographically. African American populations were increasing rapidly after World War II. Uh, white populations were moving out of older housing stock, moving elsewhere into the Chicago metropolitan area, and that the replacement populations were largely African American. Uh, and indeed today, the, the south side of Chicago, with the exception of the Hyde Park uh, neighborhood itself, which is, which is uh, pretty diverse and, and, and uh, majority white, uh, is, 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 is a sea of, of African Americans, you know, with African American political representation today. Congressman, you know, Bobby Rush, uh, Jesse Jackson Jr., uh, you know, and so forth are the, are the political faces uh, nationally known uh, of, this, uh, of this part of Chicago. The, the university was coming under some pressure from some of its constituencies to move, to move to the suburbs. Uh, but leadership of the university, uh, particularly a pair of brothers, uh, one of whom uh, I think is, is, is surprisingly perhaps, but rather strongly remembered in this city, uh, the brothers were the brothers Levy, Julian and Edward. Uh, Edward Levy is well known in Grand Rapids because he was the Attorney General of the United States uh, under President Ford. Uh, he had been president of the University of Chicago and before that dean of our law school. His brother Julian, older brother Julian, uh, was an urban affairs specialist. He taught urban studies uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, but in the late 1940s and early 1950s, he organized something called the Southeast Chicago Commission. Community organizing of a completely different kind. This is sort of, in, 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 in some respects, on a practical basis, the anti-Alinsky, although I will come back in a few minutes and I will identify, I will identify for you the true anti-Alinsky. Uh, but uh, but uh, Julian Levy, in creating the Southeast Chicago Commission, was trying to create an umbrella organization for uh, community groups of all kinds, businesses and labor groups, as well as churches and, and community groups and ethnic organizations and so forth for the purpose of, of, of preserving a neighborhood, creating stability, preserving stability of the neighborhood, a sense of solidarity uh, in a kind of positive way, not identifying grievances, but identifying goals. Uh, the goals to keep, to stay here. We all want to stay here. We want to keep the university here. We want to improve um, the, the design of the neighborhood. We want to attract better shops and restaurants. Th those were the sorts of the goals of the Southeast Chicago Commission and the aim, the, the, the undeniable aim of the Southeast Chicago Commission was to keep the faculty and the students and the moms and dads of the students happy so that the University of Chicago, which you know, obviously is, is, is one of the premier academic institutions in all you know, the United States, in the city, in the heart of the city of Chicago. And they succeeded. Uh, they, they, they succeeded in doing that. So the University of Milton Friedman and the University of Enrico Fermi, uh, with all its laboratories and libraries and other assets, has remained very much in the heart of the, of the inner city doing what it does and, and doing it reasonably well. But in trying to organize the African-American neighborhood around Hyde Park, uh, Alinsky pointed his finger at the University of Chicago and, and you know, tried to make the claim that the distress that you're feeling, your, your, your difficulty in finding jobs, your difficulty in moving into the, the superior housing stock of Hyde Park because white people are not fleeing uh, and so forth, is the result of the racism of the University of Chicago, which is intentionally trying to keep white people there and not let black people move in. Uh, so so thus, was, thus was set the stage of, of the conflict. Now, by the way, I mean, note the delicious irony, and it is, it is, it, it's, it's an irony that it recurs over and over again in history. This is, in some respects, a battle between, between the left and the lefter. Um, uh, because because al although, although uh, uh, Edward Levy, as a, as a lawyer and constitutional scholar and so forth, was in many respects a man of the, of the right, uh, uh, he, he was, in, 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 in terms of political orientation, uh, notwithstanding his uh, rather, rather nonpartisan and, you know, in, given the context of the time, attempt at a straight down the middle uh, approach to management of the Department of Justice, he, he certainly was sympathetic with the left. And his brother Julian um, Levy was uh, was uh, not a fan of free markets and competitive uh, market economics unless unless it was convenient. But he was perfectly he was perfectly happy to use the tools of state power to achieve ends he wanted. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly used the, the power of the state government of Illinois and the power of the city of Chicago to condemn land, private property, turn over the ownership to the university in order to build the amenities 
that he thought were necessary in order to make the neighborhood desirable and, and, and keep people uh, keepable there. So, so you have one set of actors using state power um, and another set of actors dreaming, hoping to use state power, you know, competing against each other. But notice what the competing alternatives were. Uh, one set was, was trying to stabilize things. One set was trying to preserve something. So these sort of conservative lefties trying to, trying, trying to use state power to preserve something they thought was good, whereas the other, the other set were trying to, hoping somehow to in, in inject power, turn things over, to change things. And um, as, as you will see in a, in a moment, where Alinsky failed over and over and over again was, at the end of the day, there was no grand end game for Alinsky. There was no grand set of goals that he thought uh, he wanted to achieve. He could never sit down and articulate for people um, where it was he wanted to lead them. Where was the promised land to which this Moses was going to lead them through whatever violence, storm and drong and, and distress was necessary to go, from, to, to go through to get from here to there. Um, rather, the, um, the brilliance, the uniqueness, the genius, uh, and the fundamental flaw uh, of Saul Alinsky was he was all about uh, change, violence, conflict, confrontation, and so on for its own sake. It, it all led nowhere. Um, and um, um, s s it, it was rooted in a deep-seated, fundamental antipathy to American society as he found it, as he grew up in it, and as he understood it was aimed. He fundamentally, fundamentally didn't think that the United States of America, the whole American experiment, or the, the whole notion of Western Civ, was all it's cracked up to be. It was full of flaws, full of sins. Uh, many of its sins, such as slavery and racism, were original and could never be eradicated. Uh, and so he was, you know, one of that genre, one of that, that kind of American um, who uh, you know, didn't share the sunny optimism of a Reagan or the, or the, 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 the sheer gut conviction that this, this country, is, as John Kennedy said, um, the world's last best hope, um, uh, that this wasn't, uh, this wasn't a place where one could be proud of Washington and Lincoln for having put in motion this grand experiment in self-government didn't see, didn't see uh, you know, I, 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 I rather suspect most of us in this room do, for example, oh, of course we acknowledge the, the sin of slavery. Of course, when, when slavery is a, this, this early permanent stain on, on the American historical record. But what we get that they don't get is, 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 the, is that slavery was a universal condition. Um, and, 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 and slavery persists today. I mean, there are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are people trafficking in human slaves right now. Uh, at this moment, uh, in, in, in various countries in the Middle East, it's, uh, it's, uh, quiet. Uh, it's a quiet traffic, uh, but it's very real. It, it's, it's persistent. Uh, and the, the amazing thing is uh, that um, while the President of, of the United States will not allow himself to be photographed shaking the hand of the Prime Minister of a country whose uh, fundamental history has to do with rebellion against slavery, uh, you know the story of which I'm speaking? You can read about it in a book called Exodus. Um, uh, the President of the United States will not shake the, the hand of the Prime Minister of the remnant of that nation, uh, uh, but, uh, but has no problem bowing uh, uh, to the, uh, the king uh, of a country that to this day practices slavery. Uh, and I mean sh human chattel slavery, buying and selling human beings. Um, well, um, slavery was a, was a sin. Uh, but it was a trade uh, practiced around the world and would not have been practiced if there were not, uh, you know, for example, m m black African populations, uh, kingdoms in black Africa that would conquer other tribes and then turn around and sell those other tribes to uh, merchants, uh, European merchants who were in the, in the trade, and not just taking slaves uh, to the Western Hemisphere, but dealing in slaves in the Eastern Hemisphere as well. And uh, if you stop and think about it, the first time, the first documented time in human history when any major political movement said unambiguously and clearly that all men are created equal, all are, are created equal, and, and laid the undeniable intellectual and political foundations for the permanent eradication of slavery from the, uh, from the earth, it was in the founding of the United States. Uh, and it was, it was in the founding of the United States on the lines laid out by Washington and Madison and Jefferson and Hamilton Adams and the, the other founders uh, that were planted the seeds of the collapse of slavery in this country and the, and the intellectual case that made slavery once and for all permanently indefensible everywhere in the world. And there's no one, including the British anti-slavers of the early 19th century, who will deny 
uh, that the, the roots of the movement, the, the firm political and intellectual ground, groundwork of the movement was laid in the founding documents of the uh, United States of America. That meant nothing to Alinsky, uh, who's, who's in his gut uh, found uh, uh, the, uh, the American experiment on, on satisfying and not all it's cracked up to be. Sound familiar? Um, now, um, I commend to you a text. If, if you haven't read it, um, I urge you to do so. It's, it's inexpensive. It's available almost everywhere. It's Saul Alinsky's magnum opus, Rules for Radicals, uh, published toward the end of his life. There was an earlier book, which you can also find, a kind of a companion volume, Reveille for Radicals, published in 1946. And, and thoughts are there. It's a, it's a um, provocative piece intended to energize uh, people right in the wake of, uh, of World War II. Uh, but toward the end of his life, after decades of practicing his, the profession he invented, community organizing, he distilled his, his thinking into this book, and uh, this book lays out in sort of numbered rules, you know, step by step, um, the, uh, uh, the action plan uh, for the community organizer. Now, what may surprise you is that you'd think that this book is, you know, all about urban affairs, that it is, it is all about um, uh, concrete measures for addressing you know, inner city problems, racial conflicts, uh, that sort of thing. You, you will be surprised when you get into it to, to see that he very candidly deals. But let, let, me say, let, me say, let me back up for just a moment and say, Saul Alinsky was a very bright man, extremely bright man, learned, well-read, with an, a surprising and astonishingly wide array of uh, connections and interactions. Uh, I have only recently become aware of a lengthy correspondence he maintained over a period of years with Jacques Maritain, the philosopher at the university, on the faculty of the University of Notre Dame in which they dealt with the damnedest uh, topics uh, going, going back and forth and far afield from you know, what you might think of as, as community organizing. But as you will see, as you will see, uh, Saul Linsky made no bones about the way in which he viewed the world uh, and he addressed straight up and very candidly the ethical implications uh, uh, of, uh, of the way he viewed the world as well as offering prescriptions for how to go about organizing, agitating. But also in this, in this book, um, he speaks of the role of America in the larger world. And um, I want to read to you a very short passage that may surprise you, coming as it does in a, in a book about community organizing. Um, uh, he writes um, about shaking up the prevailing patterns of our lives. He says, I would like to see our nation be the first in the history of man to publicly say we were wrong. What we did was horrible. We got in and kept getting in deeper and deeper, and at every step we invented new reasons for staying. We have paid part of the price in 44,000 dead Americans. There is nothing we can ever do to make it up to the people of the country we invaded, or to our own people, but we will try. We believe that our world has come of age, so that it is no longer a sign of weakness or defeat to abandon a childish pride and vanity, to admit we were wrong. Such an admission would shake up the foreign policy concepts of all nations and open the door to a new international order. This is our alternative to the existing foreign policy. Anything else is the old makeshift patchwork. If this were to happen, our recent military adventure overseas may even have been somewhat worth it. Now, the, the recent military adventure overseas to which he was referring, of course, was Vietnam. And the the war to which he was referring was Vietnam and the 44,000 dead of our dead he was referring to were those lost in, in Vietnam. But you, do you see in this passage, for example, a, a paradigm, a map of what more recently has come to be labeled the, the, the worldwide apology tour, um, where the, the central message is not that um, our nation be the first in the history of man to publicly say, here is a vision toward which humanity can march, toward freedom, toward individual liberty, toward the rule of law, toward individual human dignity, 
uh, toward self-government, toward civic virtue. Uh, Alinsky doesn't call for the United States of America or its representative leaders to, to make that case to the world. Alinsky calls for the leaders of the United States to make a case to the world that we were wrong. Uh, we are a flawed and sinful nation. We are, we are no better than other nations in the world. No nation should be uh, stronger than other nations. Uh, and we have a lot to apologize for. Um, we were uh, the first nation, the only nation in the history of the world to use nuclear weapons on civilian populations. Uh, we, were, we are the only nation in the world uh, to apologize for slavery, uh, leading people to think we were the only one that ever had it. Uh, we are the only nation in the world to have embarked on these massive um, uh, invasions and interventions, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, we're sorry we were wrong. Uh, well, f it was 40 years ago uh, that Saul Alinsky was pres prescribing this as the foreign policy orientation of leadership of the United States he'd like to see. And as people have observed the foreign policy being conducted by Mr. Obama, our current president, uh, it has dawned on people, you know, this is remarkably what he is doing in this respect is remarkably similar to the foreign policy that was prescribed by Saul Alinsky those four decades ago. It is that in part that now motivates, I think, many of us to come back and revisit what Saul Alinsky had to teach. Because in the, in the American presidential election of 2010, there was a, a remarkable fact that stared us straight in the face, that it was clear that the nominee for President of the United States of one of the two great American parties was going to be a disciple, an acolyte, a student of Saul Alinsky. The only question is which one? For of course we, we, all, know that, we all know that Barack Obama actually worked in the Alinsky organization, uh, one of the spin-offs, the Gamaliel Foundation and one of its allies, part of this Calumet Community uh, Conference uh, umbrella under the funded and supported by the Alinsky Established Industrial Areas Foundation and, and spin-off groups. But the other, of course, was, was Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, who had written her senior thesis uh, as an undergraduate on Alinsky, had actually, unlike Mr. Obama, but like me, she had actually met Saul Alinsky, interviewed him, and actually had received from Saul Alinsky an an, an off a job offer. Alinsky specifically offered Ms. Rodham uh, an opportunity to come to work for him in his headquarters organization. Uh, and I, I, she, as you know from her history, she, she turned him down uh, and, and instead uh, you know, went on to make her path with this young fellow Clinton that she'd met uh, at uh, Yale University and uh, so made a decision not to go to work for, for Saul Alinsky. But, but nonetheless, here we had this, this great American party whose roots go back beyond Jackson to Jefferson uh, that was going to be, almost certainly going to be led in 2010 by one or the other of the uh, Alinskyite uh, acolytes. So what, what, is this, uh, what is this all about? I've tried to describe to you who Saul Alinsky was, what, how he came in this path from labor organizing to the broader notion of community organizing. I have tried to describe to you as well a little bit about how community organizing worked. And, and um, you know, I lay before you the, 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 the proposition that you really have to work hard to find any concrete success that the Alinskyite organizations have ever achieved that you can point to and actually say, well, this significantly and substantially, not transiently or you know, in an insignificant way, but really significantly and substantially somehow changed institutions uh, for the better, or you can point to something and say, this uh, has improved the way people uh, live or lead their lives or put food on their tables or whatever. It's, it's, it's been a fascinating you know, 70 years or so of experiments, uh, of of uh, uh, a lot of um, puff huffing and puffing and, and real controversy uh, and so forth. When the dust settles, I, I challenge people to you know, point to enduring concrete achievements of the, of the Alinsky movement. Uh, but that's not to say that there, there, isn't, a lot, um, uh, there isn't a lot there that uh, s still survives uh, and it finds application in political movements for other ends. Uh, I'm somewhat reminded of a, uh, ma many of you in the room probably know who M. Stanton Evans is, um, a journalist, uh, uh, a real, uh, uh, a, um, 
uh, conservative activist uh, and, and a wicked wit um, who uh, once said in the course of a debate on um, the life and times of uh, the late Senator Joseph McCarthy uh, of Wisconsin, you know, sort of flipping the usual thing that sometimes people say about McCarthy, uh, which, is, um, which is, well, I, I have no admiration for his means, but you have to admire his ends. Uh, Stan Evans would flip that and say, oh, I, I have no use for McCarthy's ends, but you sure have to admire his means. Uh, <coughs> that is to say, the demonization of, uh, of people. Well, that is, in fact, what is in the heart and soul of the work of, uh, of Saul Alinsky. Um, Saul Alinsky was a, um, a um, non-practicing Jew. Uh, he, he saw himself as a, he, he came, by the way, of a very religious, non-socialist Jewish family. Um, but he rejected uh, Jewish faith uh, in favor of a pretty raw uh, secularism uh, and never, never embraced anything else. Um, he was a, a wicked wit, uh, often intentionally provocative, but uh, he opens the book, he opens Rules for Radicals, with a uh, remarkable uh, statement that um, he had to know uh, bright fellow uh, that he was, uh, prescriber of means of political battle uh, that he was, uh, that would open eyes wide of his opponents and give them ammunition. And nonetheless, he wrote it, um, and I leave it to you to decide whether or not he meant it. Uh, but he opens the book with the following dedication. Lest we forget an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical. From all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which? The first radical known to man, who rebelled against the establish, establishment so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer." End quote. Um, now, I, I cannot possibly uh, do justice to the entirety of, of Rules for Radicals. So in the, in the few minutes uh, remaining, what I want to do is, is just highlight for you a couple of his ethical rules and a couple of his tactical rules so that you'll get a feel for what this is about. And, and then I, I repeat, I urge, there is no substitute. Get the book. It, it, it doesn't cost very much, and it, it will open your eyes. As you read the book, you will have, as I think Oprah, forgive me for citing Oprah, but <laughs> as, 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 as Oprah would say, you will have these aha moments. <laughs> aha! Where, where you'll say, oh, I remember when they did this, or I remember when they did that, or that's where they got this idea. Ah, or that's what they were doing. You'll, 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 uh, you'll, you'll see that. Um, Alinsky writes, quote, to me, ethics is doing what is best for the most. Now, this at first blanche sounds, you know, kind of utilitarian. You might be hearing Jeremy Bentham here, or you know, some of the more modern utilitarian act, uh, economists, uh, the greatest good for the for the for the greatest number, uh, sort of thing. But you you have to understand that that Alinsky is saying this in the context of the fifth rule of ethics, as he prescribes it, uh, which is the the ethics of means and ends. Concern with ethics increases, he writes, with the number of means available and vice versa. Um, what does he mean by this? To the man of action, the first criterion in determining which means to employ is to assess what means are available. Reviewing and selecting available means is done on a straight utilitarian basis. What will work? Moral questions may enter when one chooses among equally effective alternate, alternate, alternate means. But if one lacks the luxury of choice and is possessed of only one means, then the ethical question will never arise. Automatically, the lone means becomes endowed with a moral spirit. Its defense lies in the cry, what else could I do? Inversely, the secure position in which one possesses the choice of a number of effective and powerful means is always accompanied by that ethical concern and serenity of conscience, so admirably described by Mark Twain as, quote, the calm confidence of a Christian 
holding four aces, end quote. Um, the fourth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that the judgment must be made in the context of the times in which the action occurred and not from any other chronological vantage point. Uh, I'm going to parse this with you for a moment. It'll be the only one that I do this for because of time constraints. But Alinsky uses a concrete example from America's revolutionary history. The Boston Massacre, he says, is a case in point. British atrocities alone, however, were not sufficient to convince the people that murder had been on the, uh, done on the night of March 5th. Now, I understand, understand that, that what, he's, what he's citing, he's citing this case here because what's going on in Massachusetts is that the American revolutionaries are trying to build a case for revolution against England, and they are trying to persuade fellow Americans that the time has come to cut the ties. Even though that may be dangerous, even though it may cost us a lot, even though it may result in violence, we're trying to make a case that we need to take action against the tyrannical power of, of England. So he's saying, this is you know, my inspiration here. There was a deathbed, you, you, you know what I'm referring to about the Boston Massacre, right? We, we all remember the episode, British troops firing, and this was, this was being puffed up by the radicals, by the American revolutionaries, as a you know, cause of belligerence against the, the English. Um, there was a deathbed confession, Alinsky writes, of Patrick Carr, that the townspeople had been the aggressors and that the soldiers had fi fired in self-defense. This unlooked-for recantation from one of the martyrs who was dying in the odor of sanctity with which Sam Adams had vested them sent a wave of alarm through the Patriot ranks. But Adams, Sam Adams, blasted Carr's testimony in the eyes of all pious New Englanders by pointing out that he, that is Carr, was an Irish papist who had probably died in the confession of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, after Sam Adams had finished with Patrick Carr, even the Tories did not dare to quote him to prove that the Bostonians were responsible for the, for the massacre. To the British, this was a false, rotten use of bigotry and an immoral characteristic of the revolutionaries, or the Sons of Liberty. But to the Sons of Liberty and to the Patriots, Sam Adams' action was brilliant strategy and a God-sent lifesaver. Was it? Was Sam Adams' action in, in making a phony case out of the Boston Massacre and of demeaning and demonizing the truth-teller Patrick Carr? Is that what became the American legacy of the Boston Massacre? Saul Alinsky will tell you that it was. And he will use that episode as a case for saying, if you're on the side of right, if you're doing the right thing, and he will tell you, in this book, in these words, it doesn't matter whether or not you tell the truth. Go ahead and lie. Go ahead and fake it. Go ahead and make it up if it advances your case for the challenge to power that you propose to make. These are among his rules for e of ethics. And he cites in his defense, in support of that, the proposition that this is exactly what Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty did. This is what brought about the American Revolution. So you can see you know, why, for him, the American Revolution doesn't have the sort of sacred odor that it has for us. But I respectfully submit to you in response to Saul Alinsky, in the mind of Americans then and now, the hero of the Boston Massacre episode was an American revolutionary whose revolutionary credentials were no cheaper no less valid, no less authentic than those of his cousin Sam, it was John Adams. The hero of the Boston Massacre episode was John Adams. And what did John Adams do about it? He defended the British troops. The Americans never abandoned the rule of law. The British troops were accused in this hot-headed atmosphere of massacring American civilians. And they were tried in a court of law, and they had a defense lawyer. And the defense lawyer was the revolutionary Sam Adams. Who John Adams, Sam's cousin. And while Sam is out agitating and telling falsehoods, John is in the courtroom giving people the rights of Englishmen, which is what that revolution was about. It was about human rights. It was about human dignity. It was about the rule of law. It was being violated by the tyrants, not by the revolutionaries in the street. But truth out. And John Adams defended the soldiers, and the soldiers were acquitted. The soldiers were found not guilty. 
The American Revolution, John Adams insisted, was not founded on lies. The American Revolution was founded on the truth. The American Revolution was founded on a defense of the rights of Englishmen, not a throwing over, not a faking of the causes of the revolution, but a truth-telling statement of what the revolution was about. And it is John Adams who went on to become the father of the Massachusetts Constitution. It was John Adams who went on to the Congress. It was John Adams who went on to the Declaration of Independence. It was John Adams who went on to the Constitution. It was John Adams who went on to represent the United States overseas. It was John Adams who was Washington's vice president. It was John Adams who was the second president of the United States. Not Sam. It wasn't Saul Alinsky who ended up being the hero of the American Revolution. It was the truth teller, the defender of the rule of law. Um, so what you will see argued in, uh, in Alinsky is this case for the elevation of means over ends. It, it doesn't matter what you do as long as what you do is justified by the ends that you attain. Now, I, I said to you, unfortunately, the, the ultimate weakness of uh, Alinsky's argument is there is no ultimate end. There is no end game, no, no promised land, no stage uh, you know, uh, of constitutional order or happy, peaceful order or you know, let alone a religiously motivated uh, end, end stage of salvation, redemption, virtue, whatever it may, it may be that, that motivates me. And he, he, he confesses in here, in, in the book, that what really appeals to him is the game. It's, it's the challenge. It's the generation of conflict and you know, whether or not he can be successful in motivating uh, people to, 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 to do that. Um, but that doesn't mean that along the way, uh, other political movements don't find uh, tactical utility in, um, in the tactical rules that uh, he elaborates. And uh, I'll tell you, I, rather than pull them out of there, I have a, a short list of them, uh, which will speed us up, because I want to conclude here in just a, a minute or two. Um, but Alinsky uh, um, urges on us, for example, uh, some of the following uh, propositions. Um, Rule 9, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. Alinsky was a master of the staged event, pulling out celebrities, for example, to appear in demonstrations. Uh, the demonstration might, in fact, be thin. He might be able to get only 10 people out in the street. But if one of those 10 people was a celebrity, he would guarantee himself of two things, one, of media attention, and also the, the fear, the concern, the wondering on the part of those in power whom he was trying to affect, that maybe there's more to this movement than we know. You know, maybe it's deeper, more broadly seated, has more influential people behind it. So it, it, the, the, the um, megaphone effect, the, the uh, leveraging, the multiplying effect of having at least one celebrity in, in your ranks uh, is, um, is, uh, is extremely valuable. You ever see that happen? Um, rule one, uh, power is not only what you have, but it's what the enemy thinks you have. Uh, it's, a, it's a game of poker. It's a game of bluffing, uh, often. Uh, rule uh, three, when, wherever possible, go outside the experience of your enemy. Uh, go out, think outside the box. Uh, if your enemy is, 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 whoever your enemy is, is, is accustomed to being uh, challenged in some staid sort of way or is, is accustomed to being challenged in a particular kind of form or, or so forth, shock him. Uh, find some way to, to challenge him, to embarrass him. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a businessman who you know, may be accustomed to having news conferences or demonstrations down at the office, go to the house, uh, go pick it in front of the businessman's residence. That'll shock him, take, take him outside of his experience, uh, generate in him in a, uh, uh, a, 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 a lack of confidence and fear. Um, rule five, ridicule is man's most imp uh, important power. Uh, use humor, use ridicule. Uh, Find your Lenos, your Stuarts, uh, your Colberts. Uh, hold, uh, hold up uh, the enemy, whoever the enemy is. Is the enemy W? Uh, find, uh, find opportunities to mock uh, his lapses in speech. Um, you'll, you'll notice, by the way, that sort of in, in American national politics, one side kind of uses that tactic a lot. The other side rarely uses it at all. Uh, you've, you've probably never been called to your attention, for example, that Mr. Obama has a, 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 an almost perfect inability to match a uh, number in tens. Uh, have, 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 you ever, have you ever noticed that he, in those schools in Indonesia or in Hawaii, nobody ever told him that the object of a proposition always takes the accusative case? So 
Uh, often you, uh, they were very kind to Michelle and I. Uh, you know, drop Michelle out and you have them being very kind to I. And you know, nobody, nobody ever, somehow you never picked up, you know. But, but I, I, say, I say that not to mock Mr. Obama. I mean, we, we all make lapses, uh, even me do. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I bring, that to your, bring that to your attention because how many times over and over again you know, did you see some goofy thing that uh, uh, the last President Bush uh, did, you know, re replayed for you and rehearsed for you uh, on television or, or elsewhere? The, 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 but but it, was, it was an Alinsky rule. It was using a tactical rule, using the, the power of, uh, of ridicule. Um, finally, um, one, um, one last rule is um, um, Rule 13. It is pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. That is, find, find your enemy, demonize your enemy. Try to, try to you, you have a dispute. It may be a dispute over money. It may be a dispute over industrial organization. It may be a dispute over whether or not an office is going to be opened in some a neighborhood. It may be a dispute over whether a, a Walmart store is going to be built or not built, whether a factory is going to close or not close. Uh, don't confuse people with the issues. Don't confuse people with the facts. Don't, don't, go, don't, get, don't get people exercised over a building or a river or a tree. Get them exercised over a villain. Find a person. Identify the bad guy and destroy that bad guy. Use all the tools you have to use. Make that, make that bad guy the embodiment, the personalization of whatever it is you're agitating about. Heap on ridicule. Heap on scorn. Uh, make life uncomfortable for that person in the neighborhood, in the media, at the country club, uh, at, at the children's school, you know, whatever it may be. Um, this was the 13th and perhaps the most important of Alinsky's tactical rules. Make it personal. Make the fight personal. By the way, they'll never make the fight personal against you. It, it, it works only one way. You can only do this with somebody in power. You, 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 can't, you can't take the fight. It's very hard to take the fight personally, you know, back to the quote-unquote community organizer. That's a nobody. Nobody cares. Uh, so it's a it's it's a it's a one way tactic that uh, Alinsky urged upon his uh, on his followers. Um, well, look, I, I apologize for the fact that in you know a, a mere hour I can only give you a taste of the of the background uh, of the man and uh, the movement and a suggestion of the kinds of tactical rules that he elaborated and urged people to use and the ethical justifications uh, that he urged upon his followers followers for the use uh, of these tactics. Um, I, I simply employ you, uh, employ you, open your eyes uh, yourselves. Um, read about him. Uh, read his book. You know, go right to the source. Read the rules for radicals. Uh, and then once you have this scorecard, you know, sit down in front of the news, whether it's CNBC, MSNBC, or uh, Fox News, and, uh, and watch the game play out uh, at the national level. And uh, I respectfully submit to you uh, that you will see that there is an astonishing liveliness uh, to the legacy of Saul Alinsky, dead now nearly at least 40 years. Uh, but you will see the foreign and domestic policies of the United States and the, the way in which the legislative game is played on Capitol Hill, making an astonishingly frequent use of his tactical rules uh, for achieving what you want to achieve uh, and his ethical rules for throwing out the window uh, any sense of morality that might attend otherwise uh, to the pursuit of goals in the public square. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and uh, I'm delighted to take your questions. Yes, ma'am. There's a microphone. There's a microphone coming. Thank you. It is only due to the estrangement of the citizenry from its foundational principles that uh, it can that that al sorry that allows for the reemergence of Saul Alinsky to the presidency. Could you speak to the death of the American University, um, its failure to teach Jeffersonian doctrine in American history that has uh, created the vacuum for this to happen? Well, that is the heart of the matter, isn't it? And, uh, and Alinsky's um, per years of personal triumph in the 60s and early 70s came at a time when the deconstruction of American education was really getting its it started in its early, its early justifications. Um, uh, let's see how quickly I can dispose of this even by recurring to the fundamentals. Um, 
we Americans, from our roots and to this day, uh, view ourselves as a great experiment in self-government. We are rare, uh, aren't we? I mean, the fact of the matter is, contra to anything Mr. Alinsky would have you believe, uh, tyranny um, and benighted social organization is the story of humanity in most of human history and in most places. Contrary to what little kids or you know, college students or high school teachers today uh, you know, may think, um, uh, America is the exception and, and not the rule. Most people never had it so good economically or in terms of the liberality and freedom and openness that attends our society. Uh, people take it for granted. They don't realize that it was hard won uh, and, that it, and that in order to sustain it, you have to understand it. Uh, and that if you don't understand it and you don't sustain it, then we run the risk. It, it's not natural. It's not ordinary. It's not, it's not the customary condition of humanity. We, run, we run, run the risk of sinking back into what most of humanity has been like most of the time, most of the places, most of the place. Um, the American experiment depends very much on civic virtue. It depends very much on people being educated to their, both to their rights and to their responsibilities as citizens and to understanding what the, what the theory is, what the doctrine is. is, this, is this is, after all, the United States of America. This is the only nation on earth uh, whose formation, our, our formation as the American people, comes about not because we all share the same religion, we don't, not because we all share the same ethnic background, we don't, not because we all share the same cultural and aesthetic and culinary tastes, we don't, uh, not because we all share the same language or language traditions, we don't, uh, not because we share a, a history of a common territory, we don't. Uh, what makes Americans Americans is because we share a common conviction about a political compact. It is no accident that the supreme symbol of the American people uh, is not our queen uh, or our uh, tongue or our army uh, or our uh, some cultural achievement, uh, uh, or our land. Uh, what, what we all talk about, what binds us all together, what we all take our oaths to is the Constitution. Uh, it, is, it is this vision of a civil compact among us uh, where what we, have in, what we have in common are certain political principles, certain notions about freedom, the rule of law, individual rights, limited government uh, that, we, that binds us all together. And beyond that, we say, and you know what? Once we've settled on that, then we're all completely free to do whatever, whatever we want to do aesthetically, culturally, religiously. Uh, and so we all go our own ways as, as individuals or groups and, and so forth. A remarkable thing, unprecedented. And, and, and it's, not easy, it's not easy to keep. If you can successfully deconstruct the, the civic education of young people, generation by generation, uh, to this, so that you, you, you know, you, you're no longer teaching them these dull, dusty documents and these dull, dusty dates, 1775, 1776, 1787, 1789, 1791, eh. uh, and, and, and instead you can persuade them that the, you, know, you, you, you teach history in little snapshots uh, you know, of, of uh, uh, you know, women's struggle for uh, the vote or the, the, you know, the folly of prohibition. Uh, it's like you know, teaching, uh, uh, teaching economics and you know, the, the life and death of a wallpaper salesman. Um, uh, and I'm not making that up. I mean, there's a unit in some economic text of, you know, about the, uh, studying a failing industry with no, no preliminary, you know, notions of you know, uh, you know, something called supply and demand and, you know, what price information is all about and, and that sort of thing. If, if, if you can deconstruct education so that you're not teaching people for democracy and not teaching civic virtue, uh, you will destroy a civilization that is built as ours is upon a compact among us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. microphone over here. So a, 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 while the microphone is getting there, let me say you're exactly right. No, nothing is more important than the education of the young, and you can you can see what a generation of uh, of the deconstruction of of, of teaching has, has has accomplished. The the current generation of young people, by the way, may well be the first generation of Americans whose whose economic well-being will not be superior uh, to that of the generation of their parents. Uh, we 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 may have peaked, and and if we continue if we continue laying on debt. Uh, if we continue undercutting the ability of our economy to recover when bad things happen, because the genius of a free market competitive economy is not that it always produces good things, but when bad things happen, as inevitably they do, it corrects for them. You know, that's what we, bankruptcy works. You know, bank, 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 I think most economists would tell you bankruptcy is far better than bailouts in terms of healing uh, a, 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 a sick economy. Uh, but if we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we lay on at the same time we're deconstructing education, we lay on impediments to economic healing, let alone economic growth. Uh, if, your, if your goal was to terminate uh, uh, the hegemony of the American superpower, you're well on your way. Yes, sir. Uh, you explained uh, quite well 
what my question was going to be. Uh, you've, t you've told us the dangers we have, and we're speaking to most of the people in this room have a pre-idea of what you're saying. The problem is, I believe, that there's a large population that just don't understand what our country is all about and do don't realize that our base needs to be a religious and moral base upon which our basic laws will be effective. And we need to have a plan of action to be able to reach these people through our school system, through our university, or whatever. And that's just where I'm at. Well, uh, you're, you're a wonderful question, and it's, it's sort of Lenin's question. What is to be done? Uh, I'm not accusing you of being a Leninist, by the way. <laughs> um, where to begin? Um, you, have, you have put your finger on a, several of the indispensable items. Let's begin with faith and religion. Um, I suspect most of the people in this room, I, I, know, I know there's at least one Jew in the room. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe there, there are more. I, 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 see, I see some um, Roman collars in the room, uh, which could be Protestants, could be, could be Catholics, could be uh, Eastern Orthodox. Uh, um, so I suspect that there are some Christians in the room. And uh, uh, here's the point. Um, I suspect most of us in this room are believers, uh, whether we're Jewish or we're Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic or Protestant Evangelical Protestant. And I, I submit to you that there has been an awakening for all of us. Um, I said this, a uh, few of us in the room had, had the privilege of having dinner together last night, and in the course of our conversation I made the observation, do you ever notice how sometimes for believing Jews and believing Christians, including Protestant, evangelical Protestants and other Protestants and Catholics, for example, that sometimes we feel more comfortable with each other than we do with people in, nominally in our own faith traditions who really aren't believers and, and who, don't, who don't share our ethical and uh, moral concerns. There's a point there. Um, I think we have reached a time in history when it dawns on us, it, it ought to dawn on us, that although s clearly we have important differences, important things to debate and discuss and learn from each other and fight about, I mean, in a civil sort of way. A at, the, at, the en at, at the end of the day, people who, who, who share a fundamental belief in God and, 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 and the idea that there is a loving God to whom we are accountable and who is the source of both nature and nat natural law and morality and moral law, and, and, and Jews and Christians agree on that. And, and if, if we then agree that we can reach back no further, I mean, something that's familiar to us is the Judeo-Christian tradition. We don't need um, uh, lofty and airy and hard to fathom modern scholarship to understand the basic rules that make for a decent and humane and successful society, like the Ten Commandments, which we share. Uh, if, 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 we, if, we've got, if we've got agreement on that, then we're a long way along the road to, to building and sustaining the society that we all agree we want. And, and the remarkable recognition comes in that there really are people in our midst, our brothers, our neighbors, our, our friends, our colleagues, and so on, who no longer share those fundamental points of agreement with us, that they, 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 they no longer really are comfortable in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that you know, they, are, they are in a post-Judeo-Christian world where God talk is alien and where it's almost silly, it's almost demeaning to be talking about these ethical imperatives when the ethics, uh, the morality that is encountered on a day-to-day -day basis is so situational, you know, and so not rooted in these, in these fundamentals, um, that there is a disconnect and, and, and there's a divide and it's increasingly difficult to communicate across that. So, um, uh, I absolutely agree with the proposition that in order to have a free society, you have to begin with people who are capable of civic virtue. And probably nothing is more fundamental to civic virtue than, a, than religious faith. And it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious faith of the Judeo-Christian tradition, but I will respectfully submit to you and defend against any, you know, anyone who wants to debate it with me that the, Ju the Judeo-Christian tradition faithfully followed will prepare one for the civic virtue that's necessary to sustain a free people. Um, now, so wh where do you go from there? Uh, reform of education? Absolutely. Organizations such as the Acton Institute, 
which are designed precisely to make this case across you know, ecumenical bounds, across religious bounds, and to bring together people from business disciplines and philosophical disciplines and so on, to show that the interconnectedness uh, of these points, that's, that's a place to start. But, but I, I have to tell you, it takes something more than the academic. Now, I'm here today in the auspices of the Acton Institute, which is a think tank, a quasi-academic institution, a quasi-religious ins institution. I'm not here in a partisan political capacity. In the introduction of me, you may have heard, I mean, I make no bones about it, I am a Paul. I am that rare breed, a Chicago Republican. Um, uh, I, 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 I have been the, the chairman of the United Republican Fund of Illinois. I was a political appointee of President Reagan. I was the nominee of my party uh, for major public office in Chicago, the chairman of the presidency of Cook County. I got half a million votes. I mean, how many people in Grand Rapids can ever say they got half a million votes? I got, <laughs> I, 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 I got, I got half a million votes and didn't pay uh, didn't pay retail for one of them. Uh, 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 and, and, and I still lost, uh, which, which, which tells you, you know, what you're up against uh, running, for, running for public office in a democratic stronghold such as, uh, such as Chicago. But the case has to, so, but I'm not here in a partisan political capacity. I am a Powell, but I'm here today as a quasi-academic. I'm giving you a report. I'm trying to be objective. You, 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 you notice my remarks were not filled with invective. And where I could, I quoted. I mean, I let Mr. Linsky speak for himself. I mean, the whole Lucifer passage, that was his words, not mine, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm here in a quasi-academic way to, to lay out reasonably objectively, I mean, clearly I have a point of view, but reasonably objectively facts and encourage you to go do your own reading and do your own thinking, which is the American thing to do. Uh, but the case also needs to be made in a partisan political way. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for our political leaders when they're on the stump to challenge the opposition and so in another setting, maybe even I would do that, but not here, uh, to, to, to challenge the opposition to live up to those standards. So I think it takes, it takes education. It ought to be heard in the pulpit. It ought to be heard in the think tanks. It ought to be heard in the academy. It ought to be heard in, in the public square from the politicians. And it ought to be heard in the conversations, in the neighborhood, in the home, in the letters to the editor column, in the internet blogs from ordinary citizens. Sir, uh, you're next. Yes, sir. Couple, uh, two quick questions. Uh, well, one, uh, do you uh, have a, any sense of uh, the reception of Alinskyite uh, strategies in Europe or among European radicals? And uh, also related to that, how does uh, do you have a sense of how it fits in with uh, uh, kind of the history of uh, radical politics in Europe? With uh, you mentioned Lenin and Antonio Gramsci, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, a, 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 a wonderful question, and, and, and I'll have, we're nearing the end. I have to give you a 30-second answer because it, it's a whole topic for itself. Um, in, in, in some respects, it could be argued that Alinsky is bringing to the United States uh, 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 European notions of, of, of radical organization. Alinsky is not, Alinsky is and is not a Marxist. Uh, I, he, he certainly shares some Marxist analysis. He shares, uh, uh, he shares a class-based vision of the way the world is, is, is organized. What he doesn't share is, is that Marxist-Leninist vision of the end game, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the um, uh, withering away of the state and the uh, uh, end of all class division and so forth. I mean, Alinsky, quite to the contrary, uh, as he tells us rather explicitly, sees this cycles of conflict just going on ad infinitum into the future uh, with no particular end game ever uh, in mind. And that doesn't bother him because it's the cycles of conflict that are really the fun and make living a human life, which is otherwise meaningless, uh, you know, worth, uh, worth, the, worth the experience. You, you, you have named two of the most important um, European radicals of the 20th century, uh, Lenin and Gramsci, the Italian. Um, G-R-A-M-S-C-I, if you're really interested in studying the influence on American politics of foreign radicals, remember these two names, especially Gramsci, uh, whose, whose influence I, 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 I submit in, American, in the American Academy uh, today is at least as important as Alinsky's. But Alinsky has captured the imagination of a lot of actual st street acti activists in America much more than Gramsci has. And you, sir, I'm told are going to be the last question because we're running out of time. Sorry. Uh, you mentioned um, um, the fact that the devil, or Lucifer, was the first radical that uh, wanted to destroy God's creation. Oh, closer yet? Okay. It was the first radical. Alinsky seemed to be and wanted to be a, his disciple. That is what you just got done saying. So goes, destroy just destroy and get change. Now it seems we have a third disciple uh, in Washington. And is it clear what end he's after? 
Well, that's a, that's a, the, the question. Uh, what a what a wonderful question with which to end. <laughs> uh, I uh, I understand that our host here at the Acton Institute have very thoughtfully uh, laid out a fresh bottle of gasoline for everybody just out <laughs> there. Um, the, 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 the question. The question is, where does Mr. Obama, uh, where does Mr. Obama fit fit into this? Um, I, I oppose Mr. Obama's election. I oppose most of his public policy. I, no illusions in this room about where I stand vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Obama. Um, the interesting thing to me about Mr. Obama is not um, is not the issues about where he was born or uh, you know what his religious faith is and so forth. It's what's straight up invisible out there in terms of the public policies that he's advocating. Um, the worldwide apology tour. Um, I believe is uh, not only um, unwarranted, uh, but I think that it is uh, in the worst interests of the United States and of our civilization, of our allies. Turning his back uh, on our allies, whether they are our Polish allies or our Czech allies or our Israeli allies, uh, I think is, is a foolish foreign policy from the point of view of the United States. Uh, his failure to clamp down on, and rather, in fact, his elevation of uh, Hugo Chavez and uh, and his growing alliance with, with you know, Bolivia and, and, and uh, Nicaragua and Iran uh, is, uh, is folly. Um, I would say to you that policies such as that uh, are wrong-headed, uh, per but perhaps well-intentioned, if in fact I had not had the benefit of, in the course of the 2008 campaign, actually debating. Uh, not Mr. Obama himself, whom I have met and have, have debated in the past when we were both nobodies, and one of us still is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, but his, his campaign advisors, including Samantha Power, uh, who was a major foreign policy advisor during the campaign and now holds a major foreign policy office in his administration, who made no bones about the fact that she believed and she was urging upon him the view and thought he shared it, that American power in the world is, is, is fundamentally a, a not a healthy thing. And that the role and the power of the United States it cannot be depended on to protect human liberty and, and, and our civilization. It is rather all too often an adventurous policy with deleterious impacts upon other peoples in the world who have every much as right to try to vindicate their political philosophies and their civilizations as, as we do ours. Uh, and so uh, I, f I fear and I worry that, that this policy is aimed not by accident but by intention uh, at the reduction of American influence uh, in the world and the Amer American ability to project power uh, for what I think most Americans um, I including, believe it or not, at least in the good old days, Bill Clinton uh, thought was the legitimacy and, and, and beneficial uh, American presence in the world. Uh, similarly, there, there is, a, there is a, an effort here to ram through um, a whole host of, 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 of major domestic programs, some of which in, with incredible costs, and not just immediate costs, but long-term costs that will multiply uh, as time goes by. Um, if, if, if one wanted to set up an experiment in a quasi-socialist America, whatever the cost might be to see what would happen, you, you might do it that way. Uh, and, and you might justify it to yourself by saying, it may or may not work, we'll try our best. You know, we do believe that these economic prescriptions work. But the worst that will happen is if they fail, uh, it will sort of be, we'll, we'll be doing to the United States what Ronald Reagan did in forcing uh, competition on the Soviet Union. Uh, by forcing competition on the Soviet Union, exposed the economic weaknesses of the Soviet Union, made it impossible for the Soviet Union to compete, and led to its collapse. Uh, if you know economic weakness and huge debt, uh, saddling the next generation with huge debt means that there'll be a lot less discretionary spending for stuff like, oh, say, defense, um, then um, well, that's okay too. Um, I fear that those are not accidental consequences, but maybe intended consequences of, of this administration's policies. And I think it's worth a long, hard look by every American as to whether or not that's the case. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Acton.